Hello and welcome. I'm Meredith McQuaid, Associate Vice President and Dean for International Programs for the University of Minnesota System. I want to say a special welcome today to the many alumni and community members joining us. Welcome to our virtual campus. We are really happy that so many of you could join us for the first event in our new M Global Presents series. We look forward to bringing you more discussions and presentations like this one that highlight the university's international teaching, research and engagement, and other timely global related topics. We're starting off today with a very timely discussion of travel during COVID and also asking the panelists to look into their crystal balls to consider what travel might look like moving forward. Thanks again for joining us. I look forward to seeing you at future M Global Presents events. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We have an exciting array of information and updates to share with you today and hope that you will find these presentations helpful. My name is Kevin Dosteldauer the Director of International Health, Safety, and Compliance in the GPS Alliance at the University of Minnesota. I'd like to start today with just a few housekeeping notes to get us started. Um, first, we have received many questions that were submitted through the registration process. We plan to address many of those throughout the presentation. Um, if time allows, we will do a Q&A session at the end. You can use the Q&A button at the bottom to submit a question to the hosts. Please try to keep your questions general in nature and avoid questions that are related to your individual travel situation. We'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Some of the information will be specific today to the University of Minnesota audience. We will try to keep the discussion as general as possible um, for those of you who are not a part of the university community, um, but there will be some information shared today that is specific to the University of Minnesota. And finally, uh, we will share a link of the recording with all registrants after the presentation in case you want to watch us again or share this with other folks um, and you'll all receive that link um, after the session is, is completed. With that said, let's begin. I'm pleased to start today by introducing Beth Tapp, the Director of Purchasing Services at the University of Minnesota. The Purchasing Services Department is responsible for the supplier program, sourcing and purchasing, accounts payable, card programs, and the university travel program. Beth started her university career in purchasing services in 2007 and has had several roles with increasing responsibility. Since 2007, Beth has led several university-wide initiatives, including implementation of the current purchasing card, debit card, and travel card programs, creation and revision of several high-profile purchasing policies, and the rollout of the new travel and expense system, Chrome River. In her free time, Beth enjoys traveling with her husband and two daughters, and her favorite places to travel are Switzerland and Germany. Over to you, Beth. Thank you, Kevin. And welcome, everybody. Um, I want to share with you just a few um, items specifically related to university business travel. First, our travel policy. Earlier this year, we started with a comprehensive review of our travel policy, and we were in the middle of consultation with several groups across the university, including both finance and faculty senate groups, when the travel ban went into effect. I have to tell you, those were some interesting conversations we had on discussing a policy that wasn't currently being used. We had lots of conversations about whether or not we would be considering any new changes in light of the pandemic, mostly around the use of contracted travel agencies. From our perspective, through the pandemic, it would have been much easier for our office to assist travelers by providing more specific information and guidance on how to handle trip cancellations and unused tickets if everyone had booked through just one travel agency. Across the entire University of Minnesota system, we can't tell you how many travelers were able to get refunds or how many simply canceled their trips and now have unused tickets. And for those with unused tickets, we won't be able to follow up with them individually to help them use them appropriately. Working with one travel agency would allow us to better assist our travelers. But after our consultation and feedback that was received, decision was made not to mandate the use of our contracted travel agencies or any of our travel related contracts at this time. What we did though was write a policy with some flexibility for our travelers with enough guidance to ensure that expenses are reasonable. Final changes of the policy are currently being made and we hope to have the new policy posted within the next 30 days. So who is allowed to travel and where? Anyone, faculty, staff, student, or non-employee who is conducting university business must follow the same guidelines. First and foremost, travel only if you must. Staying home is our best way to protect ourselves and others from getting sick. 
If you must travel, keep in mind that the safety of our students, employees, and guests is our top priority, and only those comfortable traveling should do so. You must also follow any local requirements when you arrive at your destination. So where can we travel today? Today, domestic travel is allowed. The ban on domestic travel was lifted on June 15th, but we recommend that you check with your local college, campus, or unit finance leadership for any specific guidance related to approvals to travel within your unit. International travel is currently not allowed through November 20th. If you have reason to believe you need to travel internationally, you must receive approval from the provost prior to booking travel. We have not yet heard any updates on the international travel ban. Um, and since it is possible that it could be ex extended, our recommendation is that you not book any international travel until the ban is lifted. That way you don't have to modify any travel reservations if that indeed happens. I wanna now um, turn it over to our trusted partners that have been with us through all of this and we've worked with them a while. Um, and again, I thank you for your time and attendance today. Thank you, Beth. Hello, and I'm Rebecca Gronker white with you Travel, and I have the pleasure of introducing you to our three travel partners today. The first up is Anthony Davis with, with Delta Airlines. Anthony is a 12-year airline industry professional with experience working in Delta Global Specialty Sales and distribution channels, including humanitarian, student, meeting and events, and leisure travel. He works with the with Delta industry partners and internal Delta teams to deliver Delta's core mission, connecting people with communities, with experiences, and with each other. In addition to his interest in travel, in his spare time, Anthony is an avid fisherman who enjoys boating and cycling with his family in Minneapolis. Hello, Anthony. Hi, Rebecca, thank you. And thank you all for taking time today. Um, I'm really excited to be here to talk to you a little bit about what has been happening with Delta and uh, give you a glimpse into the Delta customer experience. The pandemic has been very difficult for Delta. In the past six months, we've had to make some uh, incredible changes, incredible changes in our network, in our facilities, our fleet, in our operations. Uh, but one thing that we've stayed focused on is our customer. And in the early stage of the pandemic, we asked our customers, what is their number one priority? And an overwhelming response came back as safety and health during travel. So we've always had safety as our number one priority at Delta, but we decided to take this time to develop what we call the Delta Care Standard. So the Delta Care Standard is really a uh, idea where we've focused on cleanliness, more space, safer service and flexibility around the travel experience. Uh, from the time that you check in to the time that you reach the baggage claim, you'll experience some major changes and some small changes in the travel ribbon. Um, I'll show a, a brief video right now to give you a glimpse into the Delta travel experience. Hi, I'm Jeffrey, a Delta Red Coat. I know it's probably been a little while since you've been on a plane, but don't worry. I'll be walking you through all the steps that Delta's implementing to keep you safe while on board and at the airport. We call it Delta Care Standard. Delta Care Standard means you'll experience safer travels in three layers when you fly with us now. One, the highest standards of cleanliness. Two, more space. And three, safer service. These layers are important because there is no single solution. We're consulting closely with medical experts to develop Delta Care Standard. And we go beyond what's required to make sure we provide you the safest travel experience possible. At every step of your journey, you'll see Delta Care Standard in place. Every flight, every day, everywhere. A day or two before your flight, you'll receive an email from Delta with the latest information on what to expect, a checklist outlining how to prepare for your trip, and a link to an infographic detailing all the measures we put in place for your care. We also recommend downloading the Fly Delta app, where you can get your digital boarding pass to reduce touch points at the airport and receive important notifications throughout your trip. First off, remember your mask. They are required to be worn at the airport and on board the aircraft. Upon arriving at the airport, if you have to check a bag, 
we place floor decals throughout the waiting area so you can distance yourself from other passengers while in line. We've installed plexiglass barriers at all counters and we're cleaning kiosks and surfaces throughout the day at check-in, Delta Sky Clubs, and gate areas. You'll also find hand sanitizing stations placed conveniently throughout the airport. These added layers of protection provide a consistently safer experience throughout your journey. When you get to security, you'll find TSA officers are now required to wear masks and gloves. They'll also ask you to scan your own boarding pass. If you are a CLEAR member, you can verify your identity using your eyes, enabling a touchless verification experience at security. You can head to tsa.gov to find the latest information on any changes happening. Some changes, like being able to bring more hand sanitizer, are a plus. Some of our clubs remain open. We have consolidated clubs, discontinued shower service, and we've switched from a buffet-style food option to a pre-packaged food option. At Delta Sky Club and our gate areas, you'll find additional measures of cleanliness, more space, and safer service methods in place. We're implementing one of the most important cleanliness factors you can't see. We're using an electrostatic sprayer to sanitize the aircraft. We spray and sanitize all surfaces, including overhead bins and lavatories thoroughly before every single flight. Don't worry, it's immediately safe to breathe afterwards. Every night, we spray and sanitize the jet bridge and gate areas, and we're expanding it to catering and baggage claim. Our teams wipe down and sanitize high-touch surfaces and lavatories. The Delta difference means we are committed to these cleaning measures now and always. Flight attendants and gate agents walk the cabin to spot check. And if it doesn't meet Delta's new standard for cleanliness, we are empowered to call the cleaners back onto the aircraft. Before you board, the Fly Delta app notifies you when the extensive cleaning of your aircraft is complete. As you board the aircraft, you'll find that we are boarding in smaller groups. We'll start at the rear of the aircraft and move forward to reduce contact in the aisle. At Delta, we're committed to giving you more personal space on board, reducing cabin capacity to 50% in first class and 60% in main cabin. Families will be able to sit together on board if they choose to. You'll be offered a snack bag, including a bottle of water, snacks, and a hand sanitizing wipe or gel pack. It's part of our overall effort to deliver service safely. As you settle in your seat, please let your flight attendant know if you have any concerns. We still offer world-class entertainment, so you can relax, plug in, and tune out. And you can stay connected with Wi-Fi access and free messaging. We understand that cabin air quality is critical to feeling safe. The air on all of our aircraft is completely refreshed 10 to 30 times per hour. Air flows into the cabin from above each seat and is pulled out at floor level. This helps limit person-to-person -person airflow. Air is then refreshed with outside air and air that's been filtered through high-grade HEPA filters, which function in a similar way to filtration systems used in hospitals. These filters remove 99.99% of particles, including viruses. To be extra safe, we replace filters twice as often as recommended. Once you arrive at your destination, remember to allow some extra space while deplaning front to back. Again, in smaller groups to reduce contact in the aisles. When you pick up your bag, you'll notice distancing markers and sanitizing stations throughout baggage claim, so you can stay safe even as you depart the airport. With all these added layers of protection, Delta is committed to a safer experience for your family and for ours. Because without health and safety, we have nothing. But we're not stopping there. We're constantly updating best practices and improving our new standard of care based on expert medical advice. We hope to see you back on board very soon. Until then, safe travels. So Jeffrey is one of our red coats. Um, for those of you uh, who aren't familiar with red coats, they're our, special, our, our um, customer service specialists. They're top notch and we're really lucky to have them. If, if you're traveling and, and see someone need any assistance, they're there for you. Um, I'm going to give a little bit more insight into the Delta Care standard. Um, as far as cleanliness, we've been able to partner with uh, uh, some very reputable brands like Lysol to make sure that the, the cleaning practices are at the very highest standard. 
Um, another thing too, on blocking the middle seats, um, this is something that we think is incredibly important for customers' comfort and, and safety during the pandemic. So we've uh, restricted middle seats and extra rows around laboratories, as well as our first class cabin until January this year, and at which point we'll also, we'll um, reevaluate and possibly um, make changes to that, that uh, rule at the moment. Another um, aspect is the safe service. So as mentioned in the video, we do require masks um, on for every customer traveling with Delta and employee. Um, and if a mask does not meet the, the, uh, the level mask that we're looking for, we will provide a customer with a new mask that meets the, the requirement. And then flexibility. So we, we've actually uh, removed change fees for domestic travel, the US 50 states, um, and making it a little bit easier when passengers need to make the changes um, and don't feel comfortable traveling or need to push out their travel to a later date. So we do think that this is transforming the way we're flying today. And we've dedicated a whole new division uh, that we call the Global Cleanliness Division. So this team is uh, focused every day on creating the standards and the processes and in place um, to make sure that, that the level of, of cleanliness is being met at every point in time. Just recently, we implemented a new strategy with uh, uh, san hand sanitizer kiosks at the boarding door and at our laboratories. We're the first US carrier to do that. Um, we also are collaborating with industry experts. So the Del Delta and Mayo Clinic, uh, a global leader in serious and, and complex medical care, have been working together and have created a council that meets regularly to assess where we are as far as providing the standard of care that we're, that we're trying to deliver. And then testing. We think that testing is critical for both our, our employees and our customers on board. So we have encouraged all of our employees to, to get tested and with multiple levels of testing throughout uh, the, the Delta uh, organization. On my next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, curb to claim and where Delta Care standard is in the, in the uh, curb to claim as far as your baggage. There's a lot of questions about what, it, what has happened um, you know, and what that means for your baggage if you're carrying on or if you're checking bags. So I decided to take a little bit of uh, time to highlight some, some changes that are going on. So as far as carry-on bags go, the TSA security um, is normal process. We've partnered with them and they're doing a really good job of keeping uh, new standards of clean as far as the process goes. They've also implemented ba bags um, antimicrobial bins uh, for the security, uh, security process to observe your, your carry-on baggage um, at places like MSP Airport. Um, another thing to mention is uh, a new feature of the Delta Care standard is by reducing the touch points with our flight attendants, we're not having flight attendants help assist with carry-on bags. So we encourage passengers to travel light um, and, and make sure that they're taking only the need, what they need on their carry-on bags. As far as the check bags go, um, the Fly Delta app is a great and uh, great asset to have to track your bags and, and know where they are in the, in the journey. Um, we also are doing electrostatic spraying um, and our baggage claim, as well as in our bag uh, un, under the hold as far as uh, keeping our bags clean throughout the travel process. So all these things are, are, are just uh, part of our Delta Care standard and what we're doing to make customers feel comfortable um, as they return back to travel. Um, we know that there's so many different aspects that we're all uh, keen to understand better, but we are excited to have you on board and know that the future of travel is bright for us. And many of these things are gonna be here uh, for many more years to come afterwards. But I wanna thank the University of Minnesota for the time and uh, look forward to engaging with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Our next partner is Dallas Stewart. Dallas is a member of the Client Consulting Services at Christopherson Business Travel and has been in the travel industry for over 20 years. In addition to leading a team of account managers, she has extensive knowledge in managing and consulting with higher education clients. Her expertise in travel policy development, vendor negotiations, 
data analyst, risk management, along with her communication and change management, management skills, ensures a successful travel management program. Delta um, resides in Utah and enjoys the mountains and hiking. Hello, Delta. <laughs> Hello, Dallas. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. I appreciate it. I know there's a lot of big words in client consulting services. It gets confusing sometimes. So, But thank you. On behalf of um, Christofferson, we really appreciate the partnership with University of Minnesota and so really appreciate this opportunity with Rebecca and your team to just give an oversight of um, preparing to return to travel as it relates to travel management, uh, we've been working with University of Minnesota for several years. And so I know that they're super proactive with, with managing their travel. And so we just kind of want to touch on what our industry is doing and where we have some recommendations. You want to go to the next slide? So just briefly looking at your program priorities, um, what it looks like to return to travel and how to prepare doing a small program checkup, maybe that's for your department or your division, touching on risk management because that's really important as we look forward to returning to travel, give a slight update on the uh, COVID-19 situation and following up with some resources that we have for your travelers. So in the beginning of this pandemic, we sent out a one question survey to our top clients and that was, what are your top priorities uh, for your travel program now? And as you can see, a large number of that uh, result was traveler well-being, unused tickets, and risk management. And so we want to take a look at, you know, of course, there's no one size that fits all solution. There is going to be the need to adapt, um, but focusing on these three areas are really uh, important. Next slide. So what is permissible travel? So you really need to look at, um, you know, every department, every division, every university will have a different view on when the right time is to travel, um, as well as each individual. So you really have to look at what permissible travel means, and that is company readiness, plus employee readiness, and plus government permission. Uh, so now more than ever, each company does need to look at this in a different view and what the time, right time of travel will be. Next slide. So Christofferson, we put together just a simple five-step prep um, guide for your division and your university uh, to look at as you prepare to return to travel. So really you need to, you know, who are your key stakeholders? Um, engaging them in the program. You know, looking at uh, what their overall role is and how can you partner with them with the changing budget and the changing scene on getting back to travel. Uh, engaging your travelers, understanding what their comfort level is in returning to travel, maybe submitting a travel survey to them to identify what their concerns and interests are. Uh, Beth did mention earlier that you guys have been reviewing the travel policy extensively and that's fantastic. I think that's one of the primary things to do to prepare and consider uh, when returning to travel. And taking a look at your strategic partnerships, which, you know, with Delta and National and Enterprise and Christofferson, uh, and extending those out and seeing what opportunities there are uh, to partner with them even further. And then, you know, executing your, your policy, making sure that everybody's on board and you're communicating the changes internally. Next slide. Uh, we also put in together a five-step prep for your travelers. This is kind of handy if you wanted to share this with your travelers um, and within your departments, just really knowing what the requirements are in their destination as well as for their health. Um, you know, what is the travel assistance plan? Do you have something available when they're on their trip? Uh, what if they were to, to get sick? So kind of taking in some of those considerations as you travel now. I know personally when I took this a trip last, last month to Alaska, you know, we had to do a 72-hour pre 
trip test. We had to, you know, go through some questionnaires and checks. And, you know, we had to purchase traveler insurance to make sure that if for some reason we got sick on our trip, we knew what to do. So there's just different considerations, even domestically, that the traveler has to consider now. And then as an organization, when your traveler returns home uh, from a business trip, you know, what does that look like? Who do they need to communicate with? Is there a post-travel survey that you should submit? And are there any quarantining protocols that you should consider? Next slide. And as a department and organization, we just recommend doing a travel program checkup. It's a, it's a good time to evaluate uh, what you have in place with your vendors. Are your primary contacts uh, different? Do you have any travelers that aren't with your organization anymore that we should probably remove and clean up within the system? You know, are there any service or workflow changes that our advisors or our online team should, should know? Um, and how to manage your unused tickets? What does that unused ticket process look like within your organization and your departments? Uh, Beth did touch on, on that a little bit, managing unused tickets. Um, and then also, are there any form of payment changes? Uh, making sure that those are updated um, as well. So next slide. Sorry, somehow I got muted. Apologize about that. So we use AirBank. This is our unused ticket management uh, tool that everybody as a traveler travel planner, travel manager within the university has access to if they have a profile. And so you can at, uh, manage any of your unused tickets uh, for yourself and also your department immediately through AirBank. And we are recommending that you review your organization's unused tickets frequently to make sure that one, the expiration date has been ex extended, uh, but also to make sure that you're utilizing the best way that you can. We've also recommended considering uh, shifting some of your unused tickets to vouchers or a direct credit card program uh, with your vendor. Next slide. So here's the big topic, right? Uh, risk management. And um, it's not just about travel anymore. It's about people. And this information came from a webinar series that the Global Business Travel Association put together um, in conjunction with Miriam Jones at uh, International SOS. They're a big inter uh, risk management program. And she, I highlighted this because I felt like she summed it up pretty well. Um, you're really moving away from travel to more of a people risk. You have to understand, you know, not necessarily where they're going, but how they're getting there and what that risk could, could put, or what, you know, what risk is there for them. Um, also rethinking employee safety and security. You know, it's not just about traveling anymore with that. It's the emotional support that they, that you need to provide. It's also now that people are working from home and how do you engage those employees? And then really looking at the employee information. They're not needing to know this information or they're not just wanting to know this information, they need to know the information. So making sure that you're giving them up-to-date health information as quickly as possible. And then, you know, travel planning is way more complex um, domestically, internationally. And so partnering with a program like International SOS to provide those resources is really helpful. Next slide. Uh, we at Christofferson also offer a uh, security logic. It's a risk management tool that provides you the ability to track your travelers wherever they are. Um, we also give you the ability to do safety check messaging and uh, notifications to your travelers. So it's a really helpful tool in mitigating that um, risk. Go ahead. And then based on a few of the questions that came back, I thought I'd add in this slide just kind of where corporate travel is um, in the return. And this came from McKinsey. They did a, a study and they're anticipating that the um, return of travel will definitely be gradual, will go in phases. Um, 
the U.S. airline capacity is down about 17% from 2019. So, and then, you know, looking at the difference between regional and domestic travel, they feel like the regional will come on first, followed by domestic travel, and then eventually you'll have the uh, international travel and also the meetings and events travel. So those will be the last to return. Uh, so this grid here gives you an idea of, you know, just kind of the proximity, the reasons for travel and the different sectors that will come on board first. Uh, Christofferson has seen about a 7% month over month domestic travel increase so far. So, you know, slowly uh, it's coming back and hopefully we'll see, you know, more of the more of the change happen once the borders and restrictions start lifting. Next slide. So more on the COVID update, we did create a traveler vendor health and safety guide. This also includes a lot of helpful links for your travelers. And we felt like it was um, a nice place to go for like a one-stop uh, a link for information and up to date to where you're traveling. Next slide. And we've also added this link to all the itineraries um, for your travelers. So whenever they book a trip, they receive their itinerary. This link will be added uh, on top for them. Next slide. And then just touching briefly on the hotel impact, you know, hotels are running very, very low. They're about 10% of 2019 volume. That, that's a little old. I think they're now more up into the 30, 40%. Um, and, you know, the negotiated rates for the university are still valid. What we found if, is most hotels are either rolling over the rates or they're just um, giving you a percentage off best available. Uh, they don't have a lot of the sales resources that they've had in the past to manage any RFPs or, or sales contracts. So they're just kind of rolling over and reducing best available. Next slide. And then same with CAR, you'll hear more from the National and Enterprise. By far, they're definitely leading the industry in their cleanliness and service. Um, they've extended their loyalty status for their travelers through 2021. And, you know, they're doing really well at making sure that they're cleaning their vehicles and, and putting traveler safety first. There was also some news in earlier this year that Hertz Rental did uh, file Chapter 11 bankruptcy. So far, we haven't seen that impact too many of the travelers, but their fleet has definitely reduced. Um, and then there's just, you know, briefly some updates on Avis and, and parking spot. Um, they also are implementing their uh, extension of loyalty statuses and um, improving their touchless experience. Next slide. So you're welcome to share this, uh, Rebecca, to the attendees. This is a helpful resource for your travelers. Um, just knowing what to have on hand for your trip. Uh, I did experience on my last trip that it, things take longer. There's not as much, um, there's not as many restaurants open. You know, you, you do get the snacks on board, but you need to be prepared with, you know, what if your flight's delayed, um, you know, because it's just slower. So just, so just be prepared to add time to your trip. Um, I definitely think that that will be a big impact for our travelers because we just assume that airports will be what they have been in the past and they're not right now. Um, next slide. And then just as a recap for your department and for your organization, you know, making sure that you're aligning with those stakeholders uh, whether that's your finance department or your HR department. Uh, recommend submitting a traveler survey as you begin to return to travel. What are your travelers' feelings and emotions and what is their um, safety uh, level? And then making sure that if you do have any updates or changes or you want to make some process improvements to your policy uh, on the travel management side, please communicate that with me. 
Next slide. And then this is just some additional resources uh, that you can keep on hand. And I think that that is it. So thank you, uh, Rebecca and team, for inviting me. I hope you found that information uh, helpful. Thank you, Dallas. That was great. Our final panelist is um, John Hager. John is a seasoned rental car executive from Enterprise Holding Incorporated, which is the world's largest rental car rental company, representing Enterprise Rent-A-Car, National Car Rental, and Alamo Rent-A-Car. John has over 25 years of, years of experience in the car rental industry. He started with Enterprise in 1994, right out of college, and has held numerous management roles over the years. Currently, John is the regional sales manager for the Minnesota and Wisconsin markets and manages a sales team that is responsible for sales strategy, account management, strategic pricing on car rental contracts for national and enterprise on all Minnesota and Wisconsin based companies for their North American and global car rental needs. John has a marketing degree from the University of Northern Iowa, and we won't hold that against him. <laughs> and he offices out of the Enterprise Regional Offices in Egan, Minnesota, and currently lives in the South Metro with his five daughters. Hi, John. Hello. Thank you very much, Rebecca, and good afternoon to everybody. And we truly appreciate our partnership here with the University of Minnesota. Um, I'm excited to, you know, give you a little bit of an update on the car rental industry and how what we're doing kind of to uh, assist in uh, travel return. I'll also give you more of an update from an enterprise holding standpoint, um, what we're doing uh, to, to help you through this journey. So next slide. So when you look at the car rental industry, you know, there's definitely been um, some uh, severe disruptions to traditional customer segments. And, uh, you know, when you think about the retail travel and leisure travel, that was hit dramatically. But um, the insurance replacement market where people are repairing cars, that, that definitely took a little bit of a hit too. But um, as Dallas pointed out in the last uh, presentation, it's back uh, about 70%. In April, we saw um, numbers back close to 90%, and we were swimming in uh, cars uh, with all the suppliers uh, trying to find parking for those uh, vehicles. From a manufacturer standpoint, that's where we're really seeing um, there's been some big changes that are uh, changing everything uh, as it relates to car sales. Um, you know, there's been a cut in production dramatically that took place with the plants being shut down uh, back in the early uh, April and May. And as they came out of that, um, it's uh, built up, pent up demand and it's spiked the used car market. So that uh, you're seeing if you are out looking to buy a car, higher pricing. Um, also there's, uh, you know, just in general, um, been a shift of folks that maybe don't have as much confidence in public transportation now. And so they're looking to potentially buy cars. Clearly um, car, uh, you know, changing expectations around car cleanliness is um, of the utmost importance. And we'll get into that further in the discussion. But um, when you look at just our industry in general, and I know Dallas touched on this too, but you're seeing an overall downsizing of fleets um, overhead, a uh, number of locations, um, staff, and uh, vehicles overall. Um, you know, Hertz filed bankruptcy back in May. They've uh, been court ordered to liquidate up to 200,000 vehicles by the end of the calendar year. Um, Avis is also dropping um, down their fleet by 25, uh, 25%. And, uh, you know, we have reduced our fleet some as well. We definitely feel fortunate. Um, we do have a very diversified fleet at Enterprise where we're not just tied into the airport rental business. So that has helped us some. Next slide. So we did a, a survey to customers back in April and May, just trying to get uh, an idea of what 
they felt was the safest mode and and uh, of all transportation modes. And and uh, to no surprise, right now the, the the car rental is perceived as a safe option. While our industry certainly has a long road ahead, we are encouraged by some of the early signs of recovery uh, that we are starting to see. There is pent up demand to get back on the road. This sentiment has opened doors for rentals to take place away from the airport in our off airport locations um, that maybe haven't been thought of in the past. Uh, business travelers are renting versus, or looking to rent versus fly in some cases and are looking at further trips where they may drive up to eight hours. And they're also looking at how they can save money for their organization by potentially renting a car versus uh, getting uh, reimbursed the IRS rate on their own vehicle. Now let's look at how we've adapted as a company through this. So when we look at uh, you know, just the overall pandemic, we kind of put it into three buckets for our business model. And first phase, we you know, did what we did um, just to get through and, and try to shift cars and close locations and, and uh, just to, to get by at that time. And, and then it was reset, what, what's needed to be done to gain the confidence of the traveler to get them back on the road again. And then we're looking at you know, how are we reshaping to align with our business um, with the changing customer expectations. Next slide. So we definitely, as a privately held company, um, are in this for the long haul. Um, as, a, as a company, if you're not familiar with our story, um, we were founded back in 1957 by Jack Taylor in St. Louis, Missouri. Jack fought on the USS Enterprise in World War II, hence the name. And we're extremely proud to have Chrissy Taylor who is Jack's granddaughter, um, recently take over in January and be leading the company as uh, our president and CEO. Next slide. So what we did um, in the React was really, you know, as an essential service provider, we remained open um, to provide vehicles to uh, emergency responders and critical transportation and uh, definitely had numerous uh, projects that um, we helped out with, with the National Guard and stuff like that. But um, we've definitely modified our service offerings um, with that time um, to include more of a curbside rental process where uh, your traveler could come in and get a car and we would check them out right from the outside of the location to limit um, uh, you know, the interaction with employees. And then we also, we've been known for our pickup and, and uh, well, our pickup service over the years with Enterprise, but we also um, have offered delivery and collection where we'll come out to your home or office and deliver um, the vehicle and pick it up to limit, um, you know, interaction with our, our people. So, uh, next slide. So, this was, uh, a survey that Oliver Wyman um, did on 4,600 customers. It was in Forbes in June, but uh, as we look, travelers will have a new set of expectation and priorities for when they return, while price will remain a driving force, especially with the most major economies in, the, in a recession and experiencing elevated levels of unemployment, consumers will be equally focused on health and safety. Next slide. So what we, we have enhanced our service offering and are rethinking every step in the customer journey, focusing on cleaning protocols and limiting physical interaction. Next slide. It all starts with our complete clean pledge. We've worked hard to make sure the safety and well-being of customers and employees is top of mind in all that we do. Um, we basically have uh, really dove in uh, to enhance that sanitizing of our vehicles, shuttles, and branches. And then um, also have uh, put into place new and modified rental processes, including low and no touch rental experiences for all of our brands and business lines. Next slide. So what 
your travelers will expect is this is a kind of a picture of a hang tag that's put in our rear view uh, mirrors. Um, and it kind of goes through the 20 touch points that we really focus on. Um, well, we've always had a very formal training process in place that instructs employees on proper cleaning and vehicle, um, you know, maintaining, but this is more of an advanced comprehensive uh, cleaning that, uh, you know, meets the standards of uh, local health and national authorities um, when it comes to this. And, and this includes, you know, washing, vacuuming, general wipe down, and overall sanitation with disinfectant. So just some reassurance there. Next slide. So not only are we really focusing on our cars, but, you know, putting up uh, plexiglass at the counters, doing the curbside rentals, um, wearing face masks uh, and gloves for our employees, frequently sanitizing surfaces and, um, you know, trying to limit the pickup and, and drop off, uh, you know, spacing in the vehicles. And then, you know, really the question with this, the buses and shuttles at our airports um, to go through and, and make sure that those are cleaned in between um, trips back and forth um, so that, you know, you have that cleaning going on consistently. Next slide. So in uh, Reshape, we really are looking at investing, um, you know, in technology. For us, we anticipate our neighborhood business to recover quicker as customers begin to feel comfortable with traveling um, domestically again with cars for leisure and uh, um, business. And while we know it's going to be a long road ahead, we're encouraged with some early signs of recovery as we starting to see week over week upticks in demand um, and hopefully that trend continues. But when we look at who we're investing with as business partners for our products and services that, you know, for cleaning, we are, are definitely uh, putting a lot of money into that. Uh, loyalty programs, we're extending loyalty programs and making um, further advancements with our technology through the Emerald Club. And we understand that service and value is going to be of the utmost importance um, as uh, companies are really um, in a tight budget situation in a lot of cases. So we, we know that we have to provide an affordable product and be top notch with our service going into the future. But the biggest key, I think, is through technology and advancements of that as we have really um, moved things uh, forward quickly with this. And one of the biggest changes, and you can switch to the next slide, um, uh, basically works around our Emerald Club. So today, um, our national travelers through Emerald Club, which works at both enterprise and national, uh, the national cu customers are used to going out and just choosing a car and bypassing um, the counter and not really having to speak and, and talk with anyone anyway. So that, that works. But we're making um, changes to um, our local neighborhood networks. And so in this case, you would uh, go to your uh, travel agency and uh, or your online booking tool, make a reservation, go ahead to the next slide. And you now will have through the Emerald Club here uh, with the automations, the ability to do a, kind of a remote online check-in ahead of time to get your information pre-done. And, and if you're an Emerald Club member, it's going to speed up that process. Now, you can still do the traditional branch route of going into the branch, but um, this is definitely what we're working towards here. And next slide. So it, you'll just end up showing a driver's license if you do the check-in and then go to the next slide here. And basically it turns into more of an experience similar to what you're used to on the national brand. So we're very excited about this. It's been test piloted for the last um, two months in uh, 100 locations across the US and we're moving towards implementing this at all of our enterprise uh, off airport and non airport locations. And we've invested in like a tablet, iPad type of device so that our employees can be outside and be checking in customers remotely and you don't even really have to come into the location. Um, next slide. 
and then um, you know you're on the road and uh, to your trip. Next slide, and lastly, you know I really want to thank you. I know I rushed through these um, slides, but thank you for the partnership. Um, for those of you that are on the phone here today and that have gone out and uh, you know already started to do this again, we appreciate this. But for the others, we look forward to getting you back in and getting you back on the road and feel safe doing it. So, thank you. Thank you, Beth, Anthony, Dallas, John, and Becca. Uh, before we shift into question and answer section, I have a few minor notes I just want to add. Um, as Beth mentioned in the opening, the international travel restriction remains in effect for university faculty, staff, and students. And Beth noted faculty and staff seeking approval for absolutely essential travel would petition that through the provost's office for approval. Um, by the end of this week, the GPS Alliance will be rolling out an intake form through which those seeking an exception will be asked to identify destination health-related information, critical criteria to deem the travel essential, and support from department or college leadership. Requests for exception will then be evaluated by a team consisting of the AVP and Dean of International Programs, the Vice President of Research, the Executive Director of the Center for Global Health and Social Responsibility, and the Chair of the Faculty Consultative Committee as appropriate. Um, and, and that has been delegated from the Provost Office to our office to, to help manage those exceptions. So, that's just a helpful um, tip. Look for that on our website in the coming days. Shifting to questions, um, one of the questions we've been hearing very often um, is about the current state of passports and visas. Um, in regard to passports, the State Department has resumed standard passport processing, but is experiencing a somewhat significant delay due to a backlog of applications. Uh, they're currently advertising 10 to 12 weeks as a time frame for receiving a passport from the time of completed application. Um, and four to six weeks if you do pay the additional for the expedited service. Uh, we do encourage you to plan ahead. Uh, most renewals right now must be done by mail. Um, new applications need to go to an acceptance center. Um, if you need a visa for entry to a different country, your wait time depends entirely on the country to which you intend to travel and the current status of their embassy or consulates in the U.S. for processing such visas. We cannot give individual information at this point um, about those, and I encourage you to check with the, um, the destination country's embassy or consulate about what their processing time might be or their availability for visas. Um, but we do encourage you to work well ahead in advance of any planned travel. Um, as a reminder, the University of Minnesota has a fully functioning passport office, uh, and it is open right now for regular and expedited passport applications, including for minors which is not necessarily the case for all passport application centers. Uh, appointments are required, um, and you can contact passport office at umn.edu to schedule an appointment. Um, it is a very convenient location um, that is open to the public, not just the university community, um, with easy parking available close by. Um, but like I said, appointments are required. So I'm gonna shift now to some questions and, and, and hopefully some answers that we've received. Um, and so um, the first one I'm going to throw to Anthony, um, the, the question came in, are airports doing body temperature checks for travelers or employees? So right now um, on the Delta side, we are not. Um, every airport is a little different depending on where they are in the world. Um, on, on, from the Delta perspective, we're not uh, requiring temperature checks uh, or anything of that nature. Um, and depending wh where you are in the, in the world, it, it is something that's in place. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's best to go to the State Department to see what um, you are going to be incurring where you're traveling. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, Dallas, I think I'm going to throw this one to you. Um, will the pandemic or is the pandemic leading to consolidation in the travel industry? And what does that mean for consumers? Yes, thank you. Yeah, it has definitely created some consolidation among um, the travel management company industry. As far as what that impact will be to their current customers, I'm not quite sure yet. I think that's still an unknown. Uh, we have seen several airlines, mostly international, file for bankruptcy. Whether they're closing their doors or continuing to fly, that's still um, in the air on some of them. And so, you know, there, there is consolidation among the industry, definitely some hotels. Um, and so I think, you know, as you start planning your travel, it's just being aware of that and doing your due diligence to, to research prior to booking. 
Thank you. And then Dallas, I've got a second question for you. Um, the guide that you had mentioned, which I believe re refers to the CBT um, vendor health and safety guide, um, that is available online that's, and that's available for anyone. Is that correct? The link was yeah. in PowerPoint. Yeah, I actually do have a link that's embedded in the PowerPoint that you're welcome to share. Uh, it is also on our uh, Christofferson Business Travel website. So if you just go to cbtravel.com, you should be able to link to our blog, which would have that information as well. Uh, Beth, I've got a question for you that is uh, specific to the U of M. Are there any things in particular that um, departments, colleges, units need to know or think about as they're bringing in guest speakers or visitors to the university? Um, and I can certainly help you with that one if, if necessary. I don't know that I have much more to add, but I thought I'd throw that at you first. Um, any thoughts on that one, Beth? Sure. Yeah. You know, we've had the question come to us a lot um, for a variety of different reasons. Um, you know, the first thing is always, do they need to travel? You know, we should always be looking at whether or not we can accomplish what we need to virtually in some way. Um, but there are times that people do need to come to campus. Um, and so it is allowable. Um, but again, we should be making sure that the person that's traveling is comfortable traveling, that we've worked through all those things, that they are aware of what guidelines we have in place, what requirements that they must follow when they are on campus, because anybody who's on campus needs to follow the same rules. Um, and so it's just being thoughtful as to the activities that we're doing, that we're doing them in a safe way, and that we've considered that as a part of our Sunrise Plan. Thank you. Um, so we have the question, how safe is domestic travel? And I thought I'd, I'd, I'd give that one a shot and I'll answer that. And if anybody else wants to jump in on it, by all means. Um, domestic travel right now, from my perspective, um, depends entirely upon where you're going, how you're going, um, how you're staying and what your plans are when you're there. So obviously there's a big difference between um, traveling to visit family versus um, you know, traveling for um, business reasons or a business conference. It depends on who you're going to interact with, um, what type of bubble you have in that regard. Um, but the, there's a related question here of what will Thanksgiving travel be like? Um, and I thought if, if either maybe Anthony or Dallas or John, if you've got any thoughts on, on crystal ball, what you think Thanksgiving might look like from your industries, um, I'd love to hear that. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll go, I'll go yeah. first. Um, so just from an airline perspective, um, you know, the Thanksgiving travel time and the holiday travel time is a, a big peak in business for us. And we have not, um, we, we've not added our extra capacity to handle it uh, just because we don't think that there's going to be as much travel for the Thanksgiving holiday. We're still hopeful for, for the Christmas holiday and, and but um, at this time, we haven't added um, any extra uh, capacity for it. Yeah, and I, I really wouldn't add anything different. What we're anticipating is more of the local and regional travel, uh, primarily by car. Yeah, I would, I would agree that uh, our local off-airport locations will definitely see upticks and they they really actually have every weekend um, over the last couple months, and, and that's positive to see. But, you know, these folks that maybe don't have a car or maybe usually relied on flying are, are definitely taking uh, more trips, longer trips um, for leisure like this. I would just add to the safety of travel. I've taken a couple of trips personally, and I felt very safe. I mean, the mask mandate is all throughout the airports and the aircraft. And it didn't seem too inconveniencing to have to wear a mask. Um, you know, like I said earlier, I think you just need to plan ahead and add more time to it. But definitely with second, you know, when you're in your destination, it really depends on what your agenda is and where you'll be. You know, if it's a leisure trip and you're not gonna spend a lot of time in large, you know, groups, then that's one thing. So. As far as the airports and the air, airplanes and the car rentals and the hotels, it seemed really clean and safe in my perspective. Thank you all. Um, and unfortunately, we do have some unanswered questions that we're not gonna be able to get to today. I wanna thank everybody for submitting questions and being engaged today. That is just about all the time we have today. I wanna once again, thank our panelists for joining us. 
and sharing their information with us. Um, thank you especially to Jennifer Schultz and Molly Ports and the GPS Alliance for their assistance with the webinar. As a reminder, this session was recorded and the link will be sent to all who registered. You can watch us again or share with others if you wish. You can also find a link in that email to sign up for future uh, webinars from the GPS Alliance. Visit the university, visit the UTravel website for additional travel resources. We thank you for joining us today and I wish you all current or eventual safe travels. Thanks for coming today.